Jimmy Buffett lived a life as colorful as his songs, and he lived it to the fullest, passing away September 1st, 2023 at the age of 76. Let's look back at some of his wildest stories as we celebrate his life and career. Seeking his fortunes in Nashville, young Jimmy Buffett released his first album, Down to Earth, in 1970 on Barnaby Records. It flopped and left Buffett without a viable record deal, and so the musician dropped out of the hunt for a while, hightailing it to Key West, Florida for a laid-back, booze-soaked lifestyle. He eked out a living as a bar musician, playing for drinks and tips. But while he'd be back on track with a new record deal by 1972, Buffett almost decided to support himself with a line far different and way more illegal than music. Key West, one of the most southern and relatively remote parts of the country, was a major entry point for drugs coming into the United States. In Ryan White's Jimmy Buffett's A Good Life All The Way, Buffett explained, I was tempted occasionally to get into it, because in those days they actually unloaded in the middle of the day down at the shrimp docks. It was a whole different thing there that was going on. He claims he was recruited by drug runners who told him that he could make twice in a single drug delivery than what he'd made for Down to Earth. Before long, though, Buffett was out of Florida and on his way to making way more money singing about Florida. Look, I'm putting on a Save the Whales concert tonight. Why don't you come? It's Jimmy Buffett. Great, I love Buffett's. What are they serving? It's not terribly surprising that Buffett was wealthy. After all, he sang and toured for a long time and sold plenty of Margaritaville merchandise to his throngs of devoted parrotheads. It's a little stunning, however, that Buffett was among the richest musicians ever. Don't let his flip-flops and linen shirts fool you. He had a bank account more befitting Warren Buffett. All told, Buffett's net worth adds up to around $1 billion. The bulk of that figure came from his astute and successful marketing of Margaritaville as a major lifestyle brand. Fans can buy Margaritaville-themed clothes, shoes, home decorations, tequila, margarita mix, and packaged foods, while more than 20 Margaritaville hotels, resorts, vacation clubs, and casinos dot the Caribbean and warmer areas of the U.S. There are plenty of Margaritaville restaurants, too, and the Margaritaville Brewing Company, which produces Landshark Lager Beer. There's even Latitude Margaritaville, a growing chain of retirement communities for parrot heads. Things up! Things up! <laughs> Beyond his own merchandising empire, Buffett at one point co-owned the Fort Myers Miracle, a Florida-based minor league baseball team, and into his 70s, Buffett was still pulling in eight figures. According to Forbes, he made $50 million in 2019, which is more than Ariana Grande or Jennifer Lopez earned during the same frame. Margaritaville was Buffett's biggest hit, his signature song, and the inspiration for his whole brand. It took Buffett a while to strike on it, too, as it appears on Changes in Latitudes, Changes in Attitudes, the singer's seventh studio album. So what's the story behind the song? Well, the singer-songwriter wanted to double down on making what producer Norbert Putnam told Sound on Sound were records about the ocean. Putnam booked Buffett and his band, the Coral Reefers, for some time at Criteria Studios in the seaside city of Miami. During the sessions, according to Putnam, Buffett arrived one day with news of a song he was working on. Putnam recalled, He comes in and starts telling me about a day he had in Key West. He was coming home from a bar, and he lost one of his flip-flops, and he stepped on a beer can top, and he couldn't find the salt for his margarita. He says he's writing lyrics to it, and I say, that's a terrible idea for a song. A few days later, Buffett presented the lyrics to what would become Margaritaville. As far as Buffett's songs go, Cheeseburger in Paradise is second only to Margaritaville in terms of familiarity and enduring popularity. It tells the story of a man, like so many others in the 70s, stuck on a health food diet of carrot juice and sunflower seeds and yearning for a cheeseburger. The character lives in a sunny climate and is unable to get this cheeseburger in paradise, a situation that recalls Buffett's inspiration for the song. What's the inspiration here? I was very hungry. Buffett told Song Facts that the story came while he was taking a trip on his first boat. After some rough weather while sailing from Hispaniola to Puerto Rico damaged their ship, Buffett and company found themselves in quite the predicament. As he explained, the ice in our box had melted and we were doing the canned food and peanut butter diet. When Buffett and companions finally landed in Tortola, they discovered a bar and grill on the dock. Unexpectedly and tantalizingly, the menu featured American-style cheeseburgers. Cheeseburgers in paradise. Buffett was one of the most recognizable and well-liked figures in popular music, with a contingency of hardcore fans to boot. Perhaps only the Grateful Dead's legion of deadheads can rival the dedication and devotion of Buffett's parrotheads. The straight-laced conservative Cincinnatians once each year turn themselves into partying parrotheads in a matter of moments. <laughs> Buffett built up and catered to his people with a near-relentless concert schedule. Since 1972, not a year has gone by where the singer-songwriter didn't play a tour of at least two dozen shows. Between 1990 and 2014 alone, Buffett's concerts grossed more than $400 million, and that doesn't even count the tour merchandise. That puts him in an exclusive club with the likes of the Rolling Stones, U2, and Elton John, all of whom have enjoyed success on the single and album charts that reflect that live and concert success. But strangely, Buffett never was a broad mainstream act who topped the charts over and over again. He only ever scored one top 10 hit on the Billboard Hot 100 pop charts, with Margaritaville hitting number 8 way back in 1977. 
He scored two number one hits, both on the country charts and both in the 2000s as a guest performer on songs by Alan Jackson and the Zac Brown Band. And his best-selling album was A Sleeper, as the greatest hits collection, Songs You Know By Heart, peaked at a lowly number 100 on Billboard's album charts before slowly selling 7 million copies. The media empire of Jimmy Buffett, songs, merchandise, restaurants, evokes and promotes the laid-back, breezy island lifestyle. It's hard to listen to his songs and not fantasize about quitting life to move down to the Florida Keys and spending your days eating cheeseburgers in paradise and downing margaritas. And yet, the man who sang of the pleasures of alcohol and other indulgences didn't himself indulge in a whole lot of any of that stuff. If you'd had as many bought for you or offered to you as I have, you know, I kind of... After all, with all of his business ventures and other responsibilities, how could Jimmy Buffett have possibly stayed as soused as a character in a Buffett song? In fact, Jimmy Buffett's life wasn't what you'd think at all. The musician told the New York Times in 2018, I don't do sugar anymore. No sugar and no carbs. Except on Sunday. That was apparently his cheat day when he allowed himself to imbibe a relatively low-calorie watered-down tequila on the rocks. He also quit smoking marijuana, preferring instead to vary occasionally and only after he was done with all of his work for the day, inhale some vape oils. Jimmy Buffett writing a musical seems about as likely as Herman Woke writing a lightweight comic novel about island life. And yet, both of these things happened, and they center around Don't Stop the Carnival, a 1965 novel by Woke. In 1997, Buffett wrote the songs for a stage musical based on Don't Stop the Carnival, which features the very Buffett-friendly plot about an overworked New Yorker who has a midlife crisis and chucks it all to go live in the Caribbean. Don't Stop the Carnival never made a stop on Broadway, although some investors approached Buffett about it. Buffett did entertain other offers to bring his island flavor to the Great White Way. An offer to do a one-man show didn't materialize because Buffett would have lost money had he done it instead of touring. However, fans were eventually treated to Escape to Margaritaville, a Broadway-bound musical written by My Name is Earl creator Greg Garcia and Glee star Mike O'Malley, with a plot built around Buffett's familiar tunes. Your leads are incredible. I know, and they're acting like it's warm out here. Too. Yeah. It's just great. I mean, they're professionals. There are a handful of undeniable greats in the canon of American literature, authors who are household names even among people who've never even read one of their books. These are people like Ernest Hemingway and John Steinbeck, and Jimmy Buffett, of all people. In 1999, he was one of just six authors in the long, illustrious history of the New York Times bestseller list, the publishing industry's popularity chart of record, to reach number one in both the fiction and nonfiction categories. It shouldn't be much of a surprise that a man who made a name for himself with freewheeling story songs could also write narrative prose. In his novel Where is Joe Merchant and short story collection Tales from Margaritaville each spent more than 30 weeks on the Times list. On the other side, his 1998 memoir of Pirate Looks at 50 went to number one too. Manatees, those massive, cow-like, adorable sea creatures, live in the waters around Florida, and conserving the natural wonders of the land that inspired so much of his music is important to Buffett, so he did a lot to protect manatees who lived near Florida and elsewhere. In 1981, Florida Governor Bob Graham slipped backstage at a Buffett show to meet the singer-songwriter. They got to talking and realized they both cared about conservation and other green issues, particularly the plight of the disappearing manatee. Together, they founded the Save the Manatee Club, an organization that aimed to raise public awareness of the threatened sea animal and gain support for the conservation of aquatic habitats. We've accomplished a lot, but there's so much more to be done. Nearly 40 years after its founding, Buffett still co-chaired the board of directors for the charity, which is one of the world's preeminent pro-manatee concerns and offers its members the chance to adopt a wild manatee. Buffett was to the New Orleans Saints as Drake is to the Toronto Raptors. In other words, he loved his team. According to ESPN, Buffett, who grew up not far from the Big Easy in Mississippi and Alabama, was working as a bar musician in the late 60s and was lucky enough to attend the very first Saints home game back in 1967. That fandom endured over the decades, and he even became friends with Saints coach Sean Payton, whom he first met years earlier when he was an assistant for the Dallas Cowboys. Buffett was present for the Saints' post-Super Bowl victory party in 2010, and he invited Payton on stage to play bongos during a 2012 concert. In 2019, Buffett sang the national anthem at the Superdome, prior to the Saints' NFC Championship game against the Los Angeles Rams. But while Buffett was personally into the Saints, business is different, as he enjoyed a long professional association with the Miami Dolphins. In 2009 and 2010, the team played in Landshark Stadium, after Buffett's beer brand purchased the naming rights. 